Good evening, everyone. My name is Debbie Rourke, and I'm the Executive Director for University Advancement and External Affairs here at the University of Maine at Presque And I'd like to welcome you to our first Distinguished Lecture Series event of this semester. This actually ranks at more than 100 DLS events that we've had since the series started five years ago. So we're very excited to launch tonight's event for our school year. On behalf of President Ray Rice, who is unfortunately away on business, he um, regrets not being here, but sends his regards and wishes he could be participating. He will be watching the video at a later time. So, um, without further ado, what I'm going to do, that was interesting, uh, is introduce Dr. Jackie Lohman, who is Associate Professor of Professional Communication and Journalism. And she has known Mia for many years. That's Michael's wife. And so Jackie, Dr. J, as many of you know her, is the best person to actually introduce Michael's talk and introduce him this evening. So without further ado, Dr. J. Bonsoir. 
and this stuff. Uh, so I need help, I have to be polite. Uh, that all, we have some speakers of Chinese as well. The point of doing that was not to show off my linguistic wisdom, and in fact the Chinese members of the audience will find out very quickly that my Chinese at least is still pretty babyish. Um, but there's hope. I just talked to a colleague who's about to turn 82, and he just started learning Chinese, so it can be done. I keep telling myself. Um, but the point really was to say to you that there's nothing frightening about learning a language. There's nothing frightening about going into strange places. And I want to share with you some of my own experiences of doing that. Because Jackie uh, has made me sound more intimidating than I like, I only want to be intimidating to people like her, in fact. Um, I want to share with you, first of all, though, uh, a couple of rather intimate details. First of all, for any of you who may be failing in some way in your academics, it's probably a sign that you're going to be an academic. I was a total mess as an undergraduate. I was told by my advisor that I needed a lot more self-discipline. He said it in a very nasty way, which I won't repeat. And that he clearly thought I had no future at all. Well, I suppose you could say that getting an academic career wasn't much of a future. It depends how you look at it. I frankly would not trade this work that Jackie and I do for any other in the world. But it is true that in my version of it, there's a lot of travel. And I'm going to take you on that voyage today uh, to several places, and we'll be zigzagging to and fro among them, because I want to do this thematically to open up for you some of the kinds of experiences that make being a social anthropologist uh, a worthwhile enterprise. And now we discover that I have that typical academic inability to make the machine work. Oh, it's probably this way, no? It's this way. Not working. Oh, I think perhaps it has to be switched on. That's usually the explanation. Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, let's try it again. Um, there. Anyway, that was actually just part of making the point. You know? um, everyone can be a class, and it's actually quite a privilege to be a class sometimes. Um, I just wanted to uh, introduce the idea that most of us go through life seeing most of the people around us exactly like these people walking across a Bangkok bridge on a rainy day. And what I want to try to get across to you is that there's no need to live like that. And you don't have to be a professional social anthropologist. Uh, you can be a sheep thief. You can be somebody facing eviction. You can be any one of the many types of people that Jackie mentioned. And in that situation, you will be facing the world with a lot of burdens on your shoulders. But what we look for as human beings, but also as professional anthropologists, is that common humanity we all share. And that's really what I want to talk to you about. So to do that, I'm going to give you a few key words. I don't see any particular virtue in dressing up my talk with a lot of highfalutin technical jargon. By the way, doctors usually hate me because, of course, what they speak when they speak doctorese is really sort of bastardized Greek. And I happen to speak Greek, so then they, they give me some very long explanation um, with some words that, I, that most people don't recognize. They say, oh, you mean I have a tummy ache? I hate that. Um, so anyway, let's just stick to some fairly basic ones. So social and cultural anthropology is the discipline I represent. It's probably best designed uh, and defined, I mean, as uh, rather simply the study of society and culture. And more specifically, it's based on a rather distinctive methodology which is what we call ethnography, or field work. And ethnography, the word ethnography is used in two senses. One is, um, is as a um, form of writing these books that I brought. And I'm giving three of my books to the library here, so you might want to take a look and see what a, an ethnography looks like. Um, and the other uh, meaning is the act of field work itself. And we do that. Um, 
we do that uh, usually over a period of a year or more. So it's a long, slow process. In fact, I call it the slow cooking um, of the social sciences. No quick and dirty statistical surveys, no nifty little interviews that give you all the answers in half an hour, a year of constant embarrassment because you put your foot in it, either because your language wasn't strong enough or because you didn't know the rules of behavior. Uh, sometimes uh, real uh, unpleasantness when you meet some kind of food that you find utterly disgusting but have to eat. And I'll tell you a story about that in a moment. And um, sometimes wonderful surprises as well. And the biggest surprise we always experience over and over again is the fact that our informants, uh, rather like our students, know a lot more than we do. So but what they know about is their own lives, and that's what we're interested in. So a lot of chance is involved in uh, doing this kind of field work. Uh, the word serendipity uh, comes from the Renaissance word for what is now Sri Lanka, uh, because the European sailors who happened on the island of then no, later as Ceylon um, were amazed to find a place that was lush with trees and and with uh, uh, animals that were edible and fish and so on. And so the word serendipity came to mean recognizing your good luck when you came across it. Now. I had been in situations in the field where I thought I was going nowhere, and suddenly some totally new subject appeared in the form of a very interesting conversation. I said, well, I'm going to go after this. I'm not going to stick to my original plan. So we anthropologists are also the most rebellious of social, of, of social scientists because we don't stick to the rules and we don't stick to our own programs. We have a lot more fun as a result. So, Certainly, uh, you need to know how to recognize those moments. You need to be consumed with curiosity about other people. Some might just say we were nosy, or just pesky nuisance. Uh, I like to think of it as just politely inquisitive. But that also means being discreet, because obviously if you're too nosy, or if you find out something salacious about one of your informants and pass it on to someone else, you're going to be in, in trouble very quickly, leaving aside the ethical questions that raises. You need to have an appetite for adventure and travel. Um, I know that some of you have been overseas, some of you are from overseas, some of you have never been very far from this place. Um, life is full of surprises, even in a small compass, but if you're going to be an anthropologist, you're going to do it best if you don't work in your own cultural environment. Precisely because when you go abroad, it's that element of surprise that leads you to discoveries. So, we encourage our students uh, who are doing field work to not to go to their own countries. We have students from all over. Uh, for example, I had a, a Korean student who worked in Bulgaria. Uh, I had a Chinese student going to work in Greece. We've had uh, all sorts of, of, of variants on that theme. And of course, our American students uh, do go all over the world. Um, you need to be very sociable because you're going to be sat down and plied with food and especially drink, and you need to be able to hold your drink. Um, and uh, in some places, uh, the drinking can get very heavy indeed. Those of you who know something about China will recognize what I mean when I say that I've had some very uh, distressing encounters with something called Baidu, which is, looks quite harmless, but trust me, it's not. You need a thick skin to be able to make mistakes and live with the consequences and not be, well, you might feel embarrassed, but you just have to go on, keep going. And above all, you need a certain amount of humility. I may not sound like a very hum humble person, but don't assume that just because I come from Harvard, I believe everything the Harvard administration tells me about our university. Um, it may be good at some things. Uh, you guys may be better at others. And um, the important thing to remember is that every human being is capable of great surprises and enormous achievements. And that's why when I think back on the advisor who told me I had no future, I thought, you know, he actually had a very limited vision program. Okay. So, so let's start with experience. Well, I was in Athens in 2011 and got mugged. And 
the publisher of the, and I fell to the ground, I was knocked to the ground by the thief. Um, my last sort of conscious thought before I hit the ground was, this is going to make an article somewhere. So I'm also a passionate writer, and a moment like that immediately seems to me to make a perfect illustration uh, for some kind of point. And in fact, I had such a, an ex strange experience with the police who were absolutely convinced that the assailants must have been foreign, and probably foreigners of color, that they kept insisting. <coughs> and I kept saying, you know, they could have been Greek. They didn't like that at all. And they kept going on and on about foreigners. My Greek is not identifiably foreign. So I think they kept forgetting that I wasn't Greek. And eventually, I just said to them, you know, I'm a foreigner too. I could go on with the stories of that evening. But that was itself an interesting experience, to say the least. The village where I did field work in Crete with these sheep thieves is famous for the fact that there are signs, like road signs, which they use for target practice. <laughs> so there you are. And I love the idea that it does stop and it's full of bullet holes. Um, experience also can be uh, hospitality at knife point. And by the way, those knives are sometimes used for stuff with people as well. So don't imagine that this is an entirely innocent moment. This was a younger me, of course. Um, but um, also, it does bring home the point that hospitality is not necessarily just an act of kindness, although it can be that as well. It can also be a form of social control. When I feed you, which is why, by the way, I like to feed my students, and I've become quite a good look over the years, it's a form of control. <coughs> so, as we're talking about food, what about food? Now, if you look at this slide, you can go from right to left, and you go from the familiar to what some of you will be the very unfamiliar. So on the right, you have something that's a bit like a frank, and then you have a fish ball, a meat ball, and then the last two are actually octopus. And I mean, if you call it calamari, you might forget what it looks like um, in a live form, because we all are trained to a certain kind of cultural disgust, but what's interesting is that what some people find disgusting in one culture, they will find perfectly acceptable in another. Um, I'm going to give you a really nasty, a really rude example. Um, an Indian friend of mine said to me one day, you know, toilet paper is really disgusting. I mean, we wash with our left hand, we never mix up the left hand with the right hand. The right hand is used for taking in food, and the left hand is used for cleaning it behind. But you Westerners, you use this paper, and it's not a very efficient way of cleaning, is it? So that was something to think about. Well, here I am in Korea, and I'm meeting a, a, another anthropologist who happened actually to be a fellow student of mine back in England, and he invites me for the local speciality in this South Korean town, and there I am desperately trying to catch it with my chopstick. It's live octopus, and you eat it live. And the waitress comes and pours sesame oil on it to make it move more, because it gets lighter better. And then when it's really getting exciting, she brings a pair of scissors and chops it up so all the little bits start moving as well. And in case you think this is very cruel, I have to tell you just for your reassurance that actually octopuses don't have a surgical nervous system. And so it's extremely unlikely that they feel any more than, for example, a cabbage would if you did the same thing to them. I hope so. Well, I think this speaks for itself. How many of you would eat? Put up your hands. Would you eat donkey burger? Yeah. Good. Yeah, thank you. Keep going. Keep going. All right. Very popular in that part of, of, of China. Um, this is a dish that I'm very fond of in Thailand. It's sausages, the brown thing of sausages. But notice on the right, those little green peppers are searing the hot. They would they put it on a menu to shame. Sort of like sugar in comparison. The Thais call them bikino, which means mouse shit pepper, because they look yeah, exactly. Now, I put that into an article, which I put into, uh, uh, I published in a, in a journal called uh, Education About Asia, and the editor told me you really can't use a word like that because most of our most of our readers are high school teachers, and they might be a bit offended by it. So, uh, would you mind? finding something else. Oh, I can't remember exactly what I did, but I think I said something like rat excrement pepper, something totally unnatural sounding, realizing that then, of course, the reader would guess what the best translation really was. 
Um, it's more squid, by the way. Squid and octopus are closely related. Anyone guess what this is? This is actually a, f uh, a flower, the flower of the zucchini. Um, but it's stuffed with rice. This is from Greece. And for those of you who are vegetarians, probably uh, this is a totally culture. <coughs> but baptisms are marked in this part of Crete, again in Greece, by uh, the consumption of enormous amounts of meat, some of which is said to be stolen. So they say to you, if you've been to a wedding, you've eaten stolen meat. Um, and of course, nowadays, uh, with greater wealth, people have more money to spend on slaughtering more animals for more guests. And this is going to lead into another theme that I'm going to talk about in a moment. But meanwhile, I thought I'd make you really hungry, for those of you who like real Italian pasta. And then move on to the more abstract theme of language. Now, you know, when I talk to a man like this, this is a former headman of the village of Crete where I worked. Um, his mustache, of course, is a sign of his virility, his masculinity. This is a big deal. For us, mustache is just part of the way we, we dress, more or less. But in the Mediterranean countries, and especially in Greece and further east, a mustache is a, is, is a sign of being uh, a true man. And here they are. Um, and this is showing you why you need the language because most people in most places will not be able to speak English. And anyway, if they're going to speak a language that is not their native tongue, they're going to be very much on edge and very defensive, and they're not going to tell you very much of the more interesting kinds of things. So um, this is, uh, again, if there are Chinese speakers in the room, um, this is just the normal greeting to a group of people. You know? But um, it's translated quite literally. Somebody was trying to be nice, you know, for foreigners. This is on the wall in Shanghai. And so just translate it quite literally as, oh, um, so it's, uh, Nima is, 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 is you, uh, the plural, and then, oh, it's good. So good you. It's actually, well, it was more or less uh, means uh, uh, hello. Oops, going the wrong way, sorry. Um, and just to give you a sense of what languages look like, so the, the Chinese one, let me say, by the way, that you would get people from different parts of China who would pronounce this so differently that they would actually be different words. And the Chinese call what they speak dialects of Chinese because China is one country. But the reality of, of, of the difference between a dialect and a language is that a dialect doesn't have an army or a navy. So I can speak Italian to a Mexican who speaks Spanish, and these are very closely related languages. We understand each other maybe 18, 90% of the time. But if I speak my dialect of Greek that, that I learned in the village, Greek dialect, to an Athenian, and you can ask my wife about her experiences with this, um, people just don't understand half the time because it's completely different. I'll just give you an example. So I want to say in standard Greek, um, Look at that, look at that boy over there. So I'd say, In Greek dialect, I'd say, Completely different. And so the, um, uh, the, the question of language learning doesn't just stop when you've done your Berlitz or whatever, you've done your time in the lab and you think you've learned the language. When you get to some village in the middle of nowhere, you're probably gonna have to start all over again. And to this day, while the villagers in that place in Crete are very proud of the fact that, you know, they say, like, I tell them the same thing, that they made me, because uh, this, this book um, is actually, in many ways, the book that made my career, and this is about the sheep thieves uh, in, in Crete. Um, but they will give me exams while they've been away for any length of time. They will um, ask me, so what does this word mean? or they'll just say something to me and see if I respond. And then if I get it right, they say, ah, we see you haven't forgotten us. So I say, become more of a standardized reading now after 44 years of going there. And I say, uh, well, how would I forget my village? So there's always that tendency to identify as well. This is Thai, and Thai has, it's alphabetic, so it doesn't work like Chinese. Chinese, the signs have nothing to do with sound. They just convey meaning. So you could, Write down, for example, 
which means big, and in Mandarin, and a Cantonese speaker would just read it off as Thai, which is the Cantonese equivalent. But um, uh, Thai is more like English in the sense that it's written um, to represent sound. The problem is that you're dealing with 164 vowel sounds and 43 consonants because it's a very tonal language. So, you know, just to give an example, near is clay, bar is clay. You know the difference? And similar is clay. So it sounds the same if you're not used to tonal languages, but believe me, it means something different and you could really put your foot in it if you get your tone wrong. So when you're learning Thai, you're always told, learn how to write at the same time, because that way you remember the tones more easily. And dialects have become very important. This is, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the Polish poet, uh, John Paul. And he says underneath, he's quoted as saying, let's give ourselves something to do with Roman. But he said it in the Roman dialect. <coughs> Italy is a strange country in that the capital city has a distinctive dialect that is not the standard language of the country at all. And again, uh, for the Chinese speakers, it might come as a bit of a surprise, but these are shops in Thessaloniki in northern Greece. And this is the big trade now that the Chinese migrants are involved in. And you notice that they, the signs are in Chinese, in English, and in Greek. And then the one on the right, the white sign that's sticking out from the building, is actually announcing that what they're selling is Italian clothes because they're probably clothes made in Italy by Chinese uh, sweatshop workers, essentially. And there it is, more clear. Conversation, as I said before, is very important, and so is gesture. Now, anthropologists are discouraged from using the term body language. In fact, there's no such thing, because gesture is not a language. Gesture does not have the capacity of language to create complicated sentences. If I say a very simple sentence, you can build on it and say any number of things. You can't do that with gesture. Gesture has a finite set of it doesn't have a syntax uh, in that sense. So we talk about gesture and posture, uh, but not really about body language. But it's very interesting to watch. So if you just go through this sequence of this man, very animated, expressing surprise, amusement, amazement. Now, we'll come to the next uh, part of this in a moment, but I want, first of all, to give you an example of how important gesture is. When I started doing fieldwork in Thailand, I had taken Thai 101A, Thai 101B, second year Thai. Um, most of the other students in the class were 19 or 20 years old. I was 50 at the time. And everybody told me, you're not going to do this. This is ridiculous. I'm too old for this. I felt I was too old for it, too, but, you know, in other sense. Um, and the teacher was very, very tough. But when I, and so eventually I learned to speak it quite well, I thought. I arrive in Thailand, I can talk to my academic colleagues about even simple anthropological theory in Thai. But in the market, nobody understood what I said, and people would say, sorry, no English. And I would say, but I'm speaking to you in Thai. And they would say, oh, no, it's okay, and back off. What I didn't realize was this gesture, which I unconsciously carried forward from my Italian field work, where it just means, hey, listen up, right? To a tiny, I'm about to bop you on the nose. <laughs> exactly. So um, I got very discouraged because nobody would talk to me in Thai. Few people who spoke English and just someone trying out their English. Very frustrating. I went back to the States for three months, and I was then due to have a, an eight-month period of research leave, and I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to do, because if no one speaks to me in their own language, I'm not going to get the kind of depth of information I want. I came back. The first day in the evening, a man accosted me on the street. He asked if I wanted directions to go to some place, and I said, I'm sorry, I don't know where that is. <clears throat> and he looked at me, and he said, oh, yeah, you probably wouldn't. But he was still speaking Thai. That's interesting. Next day in the market, everybody answered me in Thai. No trouble at all. And it, it was as if something had radically changed. I didn't know what it was until about six or seven weeks later, 
I was talking with a woman who sold some salad-like things in front of the apartment building where we lived. And as we were chatting, and she knew me, spoke tight to each other, as we were chatting, another woman comes towards us and says, oh, the white foreigner speaks Thai. And he said, and my interlocutor said, well, yes, and he looks Thai, too. I said, wait a minute. Look Thai, you know, with my face. It's nothing to do with your face. You have Thai gesture. And I suddenly realized that I was standing like this. I was trying not to shadow my head with my hands. The head is the sacred part of the body in the Thai Buddhist cosmology. So etiquette demanded that I should be careful about that. And all my gestures were inward pointing. So even I pointed to something, you go like that, and go like that, or go with my hand. So I become physically more Thai in a way that made them think that I knew Thai. And I subsequently heard people say it again. So it wasn't just, you know, an unsure deal. So clearly, manners and rules also reflect that gestural component. Um, some of the manners that you meet in various places, this is in Crete again, but in urban Crete, um, are not so different from our own. But, yes, yeah, getting hungry, huh? Or you had, have you had your stuff? I hope so, because we've got some more food pictures coming. But um, in Greece, you don't uh, take a dish for yourself. Everybody shares everything on the table. Now, some Americans are very spooked by this because they think, oh, uh -huh, unhygienic. But I don't think I've got more sick in Greece than I have in this country or in Britain. So I don't think um, that, uh, the fear is a justifiable one. And in fact, it speaks to one very important anthropological discovery, which is that dirt is not actually biological. Dirt is a, a cultural concept. As the great British anthropologist Mary Douglas once said, dirt is matter out of place. So when somebody says, let me take your dirty plate for you, right? I'm sometimes tempted to say to the waiter, um, if it's dirty, why did you serve me food on it? To make the point that it's not really a matter of biological dirt at all. Anyway, people share their food. <coughs> but in some quarters, people are still very formal. This is actually from Thailand, but it's from a period of Thai history when people were um, still very carefully imitating British habits. And so the place setting is what you would have found in an upper class Victorian home. This is also part of that. If you think Thais eat with chopsticks, think again. They do occasionally in noodle shops, but basically they use spoon and fork. This was supposed to make them more, as they, to they use the Thai word here, siwilai. You could imagine what that comes from, right? Siwilai. It makes them more civilized because they use these Western utensils, but there's a sting in the tail. So when Americans go to Thailand and you tell them, you eat with spoon and fork two-handed, and you must not put your fork in your mouth. Americans who are used to eating one-handed with a fork are totally baffled. They say, how am I supposed to eat? Well, you eat two-handed, and you use the spoon to do what in America is considered a no-no for an adult, which is to take all the food into your mouth with a spoon. So the rules vary a lot, and when you get them wrong, you can find yourself in trouble. <coughs> you see the preparation for food, and, and on the individual plates, the spoon and fork again. This is the greeting that I gave you this evening when I said good evening to your time. It's called a Y. It comes from the Hindu gesture of Namaste, but it's very, it has a very different meaning in Thailand, because when you do this, the height with which you hold your hands is an index of the relationship between you and the other person. If the other person is your superior, you do like that. Sometimes you can do it to be ironic, too, but um, that's another story. Um, if you go like this, it means the other person is basically your inferior. This is a very hierarchical society. In the United States, you're taught that hierarchy is a bad thing, but there are many countries in the world where hierarchy is deeply entrenched, and Thailand is certainly one of them. He is the president of the community, but he's being super respectful because the man he's greeting, um, and you can't see the picture, was formerly a palace policeman and therefore a royal association, and also an elder of the community. Same man, now defending his community against the city cops who are gradually 
putting pressure on this community that they want to evict. And he's gesticulating with his hands. He's making a gesture because they said, the place is an eyesore. And he said, look, I have a sore eye. And then when he gets rid of them, he does it like this. He's being respectful. He, this is the beginning of, he goes to each one of the police, but like this, so contrary that he's obviously rude, but they can't say anything because he's being polite. Ties are masters of irony. And this is one of the ways in which it's expressed, through the body, through gesture, rather than perhaps than through language. When you learn a language, you often pick up the gestures that go with it unconsciously. And that's what happened to me in, actually, in every language I've learned, because uh, I seem to do it uh, in all the different languages. Height, then, is important. And height means that those who are higher, physically, are expressing a superiority. So this is a meeting in the same community. Notice the older men are seated, squatting on the tables. The young women are in front. <coughs> it gives them a place where they can be heard, but it's definitely uh, the respectful place for them to be in relation to the community elders. And the symbol of Bangkok <coughs> itself shows the god uh, uh, Rama, uh, Rama riding his elephant. Um, and uh, again, height is clearly being symbolized. Here we see the uh, sister of the current king of Thailand, so a very prominent royal personage. And the man who is asking her to autograph a copy of her book of photography for him is a very, was a very powerful politician. He was secretary general of the uh, of ASEAN, which is like the, you know, the equivalent of the European Union for Southeast Asia. Um, but notice that he is putting himself on a lower level than her. When she goes into a building, anybody who is, would be visible to her must not be on a level uh, higher than she is. And I'm also, and that's true of all the royal. So I was once in a car going to the airport. Fortunately, I was in plenty of time for my plane because we were stopped for three quarters of an hour because the crown prince was about to drive through on a lower road and we could not be above the prince. So, inequality. But there are also forms of equality that come about through reciprocity. Here we are back in Crete. Card games, obviously, um, they're a form of competition as much as reciprocity. This is a sheet that had apparently been stolen, and suddenly they realized it had been stolen and so they mark its ears to show that it now belongs to them. So what these people are engaged in is what anthropologists call negative reciprocity. In other words, you steal from someone, he steals back from you. This escalates, so you increase the number of sheep stolen each time until a mutual friends intervene. And at that point, the, the two shepherds have to come together and drink a toast which symbolizes masculinity, and they drink a toast, uh, salt and water, meaning may our enmity now dissipate the way salt dissolves in water. Um, but this was an unusual chance actually to photograph a piece of a moment in, in a sequence of actual theft. And reciprocity is also uh, formalized. So, for example, when there's a marriage, um, the brides uh, the bride and her female relatives make these very special breads uh, for uh, the groom's family. And all of the related villagers used to bring one quarter of an animal, a sheep usually, uh, you know, slaughtered of course, and some bread and macaroni. There's been inflation, and so now instead of a quarter, it's a whole animal and forget about the, 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 the pasta and the bread. But the important thing about those last few photographs is that they are about something that Greeks recognize as a moral and social obligation. That is, you repay what is given to you. Because as a member of the village, you will have eaten at somebody's feast. So then you are obligated to give a big feast. Somebody has stolen from you, you steal back. There's a strong, powerful sense of paying back debts. Now, Greece has gone through a terrific 
national debt crisis. And I maintain that you cannot understand the <coughs> reaction to that crisis unless you know how important the concept of obligation and debt are to that. The word for obligation, hypotheos, it literally means being under a debt, as we might say in English, I'm indebted to you. So here's the middle of the debt crisis. People are desperately drawing money from banks that are restricting the amount of money they, they, they're allowed to take out. And the, 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 the other bank is shuttered, and actually the sign says open night and day, which I find highly ironic. Um, posters appeared everywhere that says, we don't owe, we don't sell, we don't pay. Meaning we are rejecting the idea that we owe the European money anything for the money that it loaned us, because after all, they took so much away from us. Um, and, and they were demonstrating the placard said, you, you and your debt get out of here. And this one is a particularly interesting one because it says no to local and foreign uh, money lenders, meaning that the banks were acting like cheap money lenders, like loan sharks, and that the whole country was a victim uh, of this process. Religion. In the, now, we can study religion from a lot of different angles. But anthropologists are interested in what religion means in everyday life. So I thought this actually is an example that um, is quite interesting. This is from Rome. And it's a medallion, of course, of the Virgin Mary with the baby and with Joseph. Now, these medallions, as they're called, are, or Madonelli in Italian, are everywhere in this particular area where we were doing field work. And you might have thought this meant that these people were much more pious than other Italians. Not a bit of it. It was a, an infamous area full of brothels, uh, famous for its uh, low life, its malavita, its, its uh, underworld, and especially, uh, in fact, it's probably the, the most ancient uh, red light district in the world because it's had prostitutes there for at least 2,000 years. We know that from historical sources. And the reason there are so many of these medallions is that these people had much greater need than the more respectable people of the intercession of the Virgin Mary with Christ, because Christ is seen as a very distant, severe figure. But as you know, in Italy, mamma is very important. Right? And so mamma, Madonna, is the figure who uh, mediates between a severe Christ and the sinner. And so the, 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 the region, the district, is absolutely full of it. It's also full of signs that this is a long inscription. There's another Madonna actually just above it. But this one's interesting because it's about uh, how you can shorten your time in purgatory by praying the quiet number of times in front of this image. Religion in Thailand. Thai, Thailand is a Buddhist country. But if Buddhism is interestingly mixed with, as we've already seen, uh, some Hindu elements. Uh, there's a monk, by the way, with a picture of the late king, which he thought made him look more attractive, as he said, or more beautiful. An interesting concept. Um, people don't make a separation between ordinary life and religion. So here are people just eating around uh, a shop that sells these, these images. And offerings made to ancestors in many parts of, of Asia. This is, I think, a cup of coffee that's being given, presumably, to some, to some spirit of the dear departed. Um, of course, more formal religion. This is part of the original uh, religious foundation of the city of Bangkok. But a domestic version of it in every home, because you have to worship your ancestors. And you feel so comfortable that you can actually hang your clothes up on the side of the shrine. Or, um, in this is the collective shrine of the community, you know, something like this. And I was a little scandalized when I first saw cats lying on these shrines until I was told, well, actually, those cats might be the same ancestors now reincarnated as cats. And so some people, when they see a cat, especially if it goes to a shrine like that, will go right to it because it's the spirit of the dear departed. But shrine, this is from Macau, the formerly Portuguese uh, part of China. Again, uh, a, a, an ancestral shrine. And all of these shrines require, of course, a lot of 
production. So one of the things that I got very interested in in my field work in various countries was craft production. This is a rather sophisticated Italian uh, electrician, and I, I, there's an irony to this picture because what that, that sign behind it, which is a, a, a piece of advertising, but it says we renew tradition. What he does actually is to take old electrical fittings and, and turn them into uh, modern usable lamps. Uh, this is a glass maker, a very fine glass maker. This is from Greece, and this is a much older, uh, these are shoemakers, cobblers. And I'm interested in these because the whole question of how craft is passed on from one generation to another has been a major focus of some of my work. One of the interesting things about apprentices is that they pretend to be born. And while the master craftsman may think that making this young boy feel bored is a form of discipline, you know, make it really suffer. He actually is, if he's any good at, at, at his job, is very surreptitiously trying to see how the work is done. And as they say, he's stealing with his eyes. He's stealing the trade secrets with his eyes. So I try to capture this in a series of videos and photographs, not easy to do. Uh, the same sort of relationship uh, among a uh, master, master on the left, the apprentice on the right, in the jewelry trade. And I found it very different when I started studying the gold jewelry trade in Bangkok, which is a project I'm currently doing, um, where um, people don't trust each other very much uh, because there's a lot of gold dust flying around. And the gold dust is almost like a metaphor for this, uh, the, the impossibility of controlling social relations. So everyone in this group claims that they're related to each other. In fact, some are, but some are not. But the minute somebody is caught stealing, it's like the family has now ejected this person, and they really can't find work after that. Um, so that's just uh, another example. Not, not showing too clearly, unfortunately, because of the light, but uh, uh, Goldsmith working. And then some of them work on their own, because Again, the distrust is so great that they finally decide that it's better to work on their own. And this, this man actually uh, pointed out to me, I asked him, what role does the Buddhist religion play in your work? And he says two things. And it gives me uh, patience and it gives me concentration. And I think you see both of them in this picture. But notice that even he, you see, trying to capture all the gold dust, refining the gold, that falls into that zinc line draw. And when, the, when they're um, soldering the, 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 the gold also, uh, or melting it, there's always a lot of bits of gold floating around. So sometimes people actually get caught um, putting some of it in their pockets or simply uh, being very careless. And then, then there's usually a huge row. And security for these people is very important. So they have these heavy grills. They have surveillance cameras, very sophisticated. And you see, these are objects of very high value. And you can see actually some of the gold dust on that table. And the, the drawings that are, uh, are made to tell them uh, exactly what to do. This is totally different. It's a pastry. And how many of you know what phyllo pastry is? This is how it's made. It's a very thin, flaky pastry you can get on some. Uh, Greek and Turkish and Arab dishes. So they're, they're make, they stretch, they make a, a ball of flour, and then they stretch it and stretch it and stretch it and stretch it. This is the last handmade filo in this particular uh, place. So craft covers a lot of different activities, from food to the production of jewelry, um, and, and of course also, and in some languages, including Thai, the word for an artisan covers a garage mechanic as much as it does a fine jeweler. So um, I'm trying to understand in this work what it is that makes craft so alluring for us and what it is that allows it to become the basis of a very strange kind of sociability where people are constantly competing with each other, fighting with each other, but at the same time clearly fascinated by this work and, and trying to, uh, to carve out a distinctive uh, life for themselves with it.
Now, of course, when we think about tension, we have to think about politics. This is from Athens. It just says class hatred, so it's pretty explicit. This was a demo I found myself in, and uh, it set fire to various things, and also tear gas, because the police were trying to drive them away. They Eventually, they raided the, the Agricultural Bank of Greece. This was at the beginning of the economic crisis that I was talking about earlier. And there he is actually breaking into the, the bank. And I was at a discreet distance with a sufficiently powerful camera that I could get enough, at least you could see what's going on. And the banks were seen as the real internal culprits in this debt crisis. So this actually says, no house into the hands of bankers. So those of you who had to face mortgage foreclosure, for example, or understand some resonate with this very, very much indeed. I don't want to talk at length about the environment, partly because it hasn't been much of a focus in my own work. But you can't go to China, for example, without getting into this kind of situation. Um, this is actually from the air, and you start to see that the pollution doesn't necessarily only begin in the cities. What is a much more central focus in my work is the question of ethnic identity. What does it mean to be something? Well, let me put it in another way. What am I? I am the child of German Jewish refugees. My native language is English, although if you ask me what my mother tongue is, I would have to, to answer you in the way my mother would have, which is to say that my mother tongue is English, but I would have to say it in a German accent. The way she talked right now, my mother. So, then I, I end up going to Greece, which is what eventually turned me into an anthropologist. And because I learned to speak Greek very young, I start dreaming in Greek. And as I've already told you, by the time I'm in my late 50s, I'm gesturing in time. So what am I? I want to put it to you that there is no such thing as a culture. You'll find a lot of nation states. China is a very good example. China, China talks about 56 nationalities which is another way of talking about ethnic groups. But actually, from an anthropological point of view, there's no such thing as a culture. And if you say, oh, in my culture, we don't do this, that's just an excuse. And it's bad anthropology. Because what we actually mean is, I want to hide behind the idea that I come from a place where this is done. So if I'm disgusted by something, say I'm in China and I'm offered dog meat, sorry, say, um, that's okay. Um, uh, what do I do? You know, if I say in my culture we don't do that, I'm av avoiding the responsibility of saying I don't like the idea. I actually don't like the idea of eating dog meat. I've managed to avoid it so far, but you never know. You never know. When you travel, things happen. So, in the same way, when you're talking about ethnic identity, national identity, using any of these terms, be careful not to solidify them in a way that makes it makes it sound as if every ethnic group is like an army marching to a single bar. They aren't. People are different. And what makes human beings so glorious is that they are different. Yes, there are cultural patterns. And that's what anthropologists are interested in. I try to give you some examples. But there is no such thing as a culture. We shouldn't be talking about cultures at all. Anthropologists have stopped doing it a long time ago. I mean, what is this matter? He's a Bangladeshi by nationality, a Muslim, working in a Roman kitchen, so in the capital city of Italy, gesticulating, Mamma mia, like an Italian, a eh? very Italian gesture. And he's speaking in the local Roman dialect of Italian, which you can't hear, but it's pretty funny because he does it very well. He'd been there for 19 years, or had been at that point, and he spoke it fluently. So, what does that mean? Italian? Bangladesh, and we both, and everything. And all of us, in one way or another, are culturally whatever it is we've absorbed. So part of the excitement of going abroad, <coughs> doing this kind of work, is that you expand not only your own horizons, you expand your internal understanding of who you are. These are Rohingya refugees from what is now called Myanmar, formerly Burma. And as I put, this picture into this very happy family, but he's wearing, you can't really see it, he's wearing a Burmese form of dress in the lower part of his body, even though the Burmese government would kill him if he ever went back to Burma. 
and this is a friend who introduced me with their, ch with their children. One of those children nearly died on the crossing, on the boat crossing, uh, as they fled from Burma. Uh, they went to Malaysia, the Malaysians kept them there for a while, then pushed them out. They went on a boat to Australia and, uh, as they say, had a very dangerous crossing. Ethnicity and religion are two areas in which more sins have been committed by human beings claiming to be moral than almost anything else. There is no place in our world for <coughs> cultural or religious prejudice, or there should be. But unfortunately, people stoke it up in all kinds of ways, not realizing the harm that they are doing to our understanding of that common humanity in which I was speaking. There's one way you can fight back, and that is, as an anthropologist, by becoming involved with the communities that you study. Now, some people say to me, well, but if you're so involved, how can you be objective? I have a very simple answer. It's in two parts. First part of the answer is, the idea of a distinction between the objective and the subjective may work for physics. It doesn't work for the human sciences. And it, in fact, is the result of a very narrow perspective, a philosophical tradition developed in Europe in the, in the 17th century, symbolized largely by René, René Descartes, and by the 20th century, very <coughs> significantly discredited. But still very popular among people who have not bothered to trace the history. The more practical answer, as I said to one interlocutor, was, so if I'm not going to be involved, I wouldn't get the information that I get because they wouldn't trust me, right? So are you telling me that being objective means having less information? That, of course, was met with total silence. So one of the things that anthropology has done for me has been to pull me out of this narrow thinking that there is a hard and fast line between the objective and the subjective. The realization that it's sometimes useful for political reasons to be able to say that's not objective, that's just a subjective opinion. But actually, in real life, we do much better when we dispense with that distinction. And we talk about reality as something that we know, but we know <coughs> imperfectly because we know it through our senses, and our senses are not perfect. At any rate, I chose to get involved in the struggles of at least two of the communities that I've worked with against being evicted. And this is the Thai community again. Here is this remarkable group of women who are uh, organized, they organized the rotating credit fund. So anytime there was a crisis, say a family was suddenly in debt, or somebody was desperately ill and needed medical help, or they wanted to build a house, um, the, the credit fund was ava available for borrowing at no interest. And this allowed a very, very poor community, and they were definitely poor, uh, to, be, uh, to, to be viable. Sadly, Thailand is now in the grip of a sclerotic military dictatorship, and when that happened, the days of the community were numbered, and it was actually smashed to smithereens by the army earlier this year. This is the president at a time when it was still possible to hope that the community might, might survive. Notice he's wearing amulets, protection against, again, various forms of evil. Um, and again, the Buddhist religion in Thailand has this mixture of formal Buddhism with ancestor worship, as we saw. And being involved sometimes meant really getting involved with the, the um, uh, political theme. So one of the most unnerving moments in my field work was when the politician on the right, the gentleman in the suit, was very surprised to find a foreigner on the site. And after he'd gone around, and he was fairly sympathetic to the community, which was, again, struggling against eviction, he said, but you know, I don't know as much about this community as the anthropologist. You should ask him. So suddenly, I found myself pushed forward and giving my first impromptu press conference in Thai. It was pretty unnerving. Um, I somehow survived, and here I am doing it. Because one of the, one of the uh, men in the community actually um, had the presence of mind to f take my video camera out of my hand as I was pushed forward and continue <coughs> filming. So I have a very full record of this potentially rather embarrassing occasion. 
the authorities eventually boasted that they were giving back this site to the people. These are the people they're giving it back to. Do they look like Thais? Do they look like ordinary Thai people? No. They look like foreigners, and they look like very bourgeois middle class people. I swear that when I stole that back from my wife, this is what happened to the community. Even as they celebrated their heritage, the sign on the left points to their own heritage museum, the uh, workers of the city hall came in and wrecked many of the houses. Some of these houses were gems of early 19th century uh, Siamese architecture. They didn't care. They destroyed everything. This was the last meeting before the destruction happened. And at that meeting, a lot of things came together for me. Involvement, etiquette, gesture. I'll tell you how in just one second. The gentleman in the uniform is the deputy governor, in other words, the deputy mayor of Bangkok, not elected, appointed by the military government, a military man himself. And then there's the president next to him. As I was at the meeting, I asked permission to speak, and the president, of course, wanted me to speak because he knew I was on his side. As I was saying, I find it very strange that you don't listen to the opinions of foreigners, and I'm not talking about myself, but you depend on tourism in this part of the city, and this community has attracted a great deal of interest from any tourists who happen to wander in. It's in a very tourist-infested area to begin with. As I was speaking, he suddenly leaned forward and in a totally Western gesture, took my hand and shook it. But double interpretation here, because it could have been a poor <coughs> gesture of the kind that people make in the West, or it could have been an insult, because in Thailand, you only touch people when you either are very intimate with them or when you want to insult them. Why? Don't you? But then he said, Pai, which means, I beg your pardon, a very formal phrase, again, you're very polite, and proceeded to talk as if I said nothing at all. Well, the journalists who were present were deeply offended by this very, as they saw it, untied behavior. So the result was that I got a full page spread uh, interview in one of the leading uh, newspa uh, newspapers in Bangkok and an insert which just played my book. So this was some symbolic comfort, at least, to the community that I talked about why I thought the community deserved to survive. But nothing could save them anymore after this. So as I say, and to conclude, we anthropologists spend our professional lives dealing, I would say, most of all, with the things that everyone else takes for granted. In some ways, you could say that anthropology was the comparative study of common sense. But common sense is not common to all cultures, and it doesn't look very sensible from the next one over, which is why people from different cultural backgrounds often have trouble understanding each other. I hope that anthropology can contribute to a much greater mutual understanding among people, including the realization that the lines between them are not as hard as I imagine, and that there are indeed no such things as singular, <coughs> clearly defined colors. <coughs> I end with some of my most recent adventures, which have been in China, because you recognize, of course, that this table is laid for a feast, and I was brought into that feast, and vast quantities of pipe of this ferocious fire water were being consumed. You may think those are teacups, and some of them are, but there's something else in the other in the ones that don't appear to have anything at all in them. And the effects are fairly visible. I would actually, I highly recommend drinking for learning languages because of course you become totally fearless and you forget to be thin-skinned. I think that was one of the first occasions when I dared to try out some of my Chinese on. This poor man was obviously looking a bit besieged, but he was very friendly anyway. So I want to thank you for your attention. And I hope <coughs> that in the very near future, some of you might actually be attracted to the idea of an anthropological career. Who knows? It's not an easy career, 
but it's a rewarding one. And as I said at the beginning of my talk, I wouldn't ever want to change it for anything else. Thank you very much.
with my words. I want the word. Here you are. Thank you. I was wondering, uh, in your opinion. I'm sorry. I. I, I yeah. yeah. Thank you. I was wondering, in your opinion, you covered a lot about some of the cultural and traditions and the values that were handed down through generations in the different cultures that you talked about. I'm wondering what you think about that today, with the younger generation being brought up in a world of new technology and new commerce and you know, the shrinking, as we say, of the globe, are you finding that those traditions are still as respected or prevalent today as they were in generations prior? Well, I think, you know, it's a very important question, and I think I would like to answer it at two levels. Um, at one level, we can certainly say that as the world has become a more complicated place with people interacting with each other, there are more challenges to the idea that in a given community there's a set of very clearly defined values. Because, as I did, you know, I myself am an, an amalgam of many different things. And my values, probably taken together, would reflect that. But I think the more important part uh, of this is, is, is the, uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about, which is what's happened to our notion of value. Now, if you listen to people talking on an everyday basis. Most of the time today, when they talk about value, they mean monetary value. That's all they mean. And even when they talk about aesthetic value, or moral value, or religious value, or any other kind of value, personal value, affective value, they tend to discuss it in terms that make it sound as if you can do an audit on it the way you would do an audit on somebody's income. In other words, everything's now being reduced to a very crude kind of uh, enumeration. It's what we, in anthropology, call audit culture. That's another use of the term culture, of course. But um, So, for example, when students evaluate their professors, right, um, in the end, the numbers are what are used. You might write the comments, and the comments are useful for the teachers, but the numbers are what the administration uses to decide whether somebody's going to get tenure or whether they're um, going to get a decent uh, wage hike and so on and so forth. These are very, very confusing and, and, and difficult times and people are looking for simple solutions. But those simple solutions don't work. They're absolutely <coughs> misleading. I'll give you a perfect example. In um, uh, tenure evaluation, in some countries, China being a very good example of this, you are asked to provide a, a numerical count of the number of citations of your work that are out there. Well, you could give them for 400 citations, and 399 would be negative ones, and still you'd be praised for having 400 citations. There's a lack of evaluation in that sense. And I think that this particular phenomenon has spread over everything. So that uh, in this age of um, increasingly, you know, the we go to the wall kind of economics, what we call neoliberalism, what we're seeing is that these devices are used quite cynically by those in power uh, to uh, uh, marginalize values that don't accord with the dominant commercial values. And of course, this means that those fragile <coughs> local communities that are trying to imagine a, a, a different kind of lifestyle, maybe one that has very ancient roots, are very, very vulnerable indeed. Uh, in two weeks' time, I'm going to be giving Morgan lectures at the University of Rochester, and one of the main theme of, of my, uh, of my, my uh, talk will be, why is it that of the four places I've done major field work, two have been smashed to the ground, or at least one was smashed to the ground, quite literally, the other was <coughs> by a commando invasion, that was the Cretan village. Um, yes, they've done things that are illegal, but you know, what is it that makes them so intolerable to state authorities? I won't spoil the surprise by telling what I think the answer is now, but I think that the, 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 the um, states themselves are very vulnerable, and they worry about the legitimacy, and again, they try to shore up that legitimacy by saying, we have a lien on all notions of value. We will teach people how to be good citizens. 
and don't realize that in local communities there may be very different understandings of how to be a good citizen. So I'll give you an example. Those Cretan guys actually will tell you there are good and there are, there are moral and immoral ways of stealing a sheep. So the act of theft itself is actually <coughs> not considered to be immoral under certain circumstances. Now they know that the church and the state disapprove of, of these actions, but they say this is our way of life. So these are holdouts, but there are very few of them, very few left. Um, and even if you look at something like craft production, which I think is perhaps a better example in that we see craft production of so-called traditional crafts around the world, if you look at how that production is being done, it is being done increasingly by the use of automated means. There's a lot less uh, uh, handiwork that goes into it in many places, not everywhere. Some crafts continue to be, but then a lot of the really fine handicrafts become very expensive, and so they're completely priced out of the reach of the kinds of people who actually make them. So I think we're looking at a world in which money is is breaking down um, uh, any sense of local um, uh, adherence. I don't necessarily like the word tradition, but adherence to uh, ideas, values, and aesthetics that had previously characterized a particular community. So I think we are looking at, at a great deal of fertility there. I, I, I think that's the kind of thing you were getting at, wasn't it? I mean, I, you know, it's, it's very easy, you know, you get to a certain age, you say, oh, well, things aren't the way they used to be when I was young, and of course I'm always tempted to try that line, but it doesn't really work for me because I think that people said that in a different generation. What is different about this period of time is that the economic pressures that are produced by the neoliberal system are so much greater that people are now made, to use the word that a number of commentators have adopted, people are responsibleized. That is, you are now to blame for your own failure. So if you don't make it, you are treated as, um, as, a, uh, as, as, as a failure, and it's your fault. And that's why you find that the state increasingly withdraws from any kind of support for uh, the poor. Uh, you find that uh, poorer communities are increasingly marginalized and maltreated. So that, I think, also then leads to uh, not so much the abandonment of tradition, but I think much more to a kind of despair that sometimes has people actually entrenching themselves say, okay, you know, if we're going to be treated like this, we might as well fight to the end, to the bitter end. But mostly, I think people uh, just find that the whole business of staying on the, in the rat race is so exhausting that a lot of these things that we think of as traditional lifestyles have no chance of survival. Well, on behalf of the university, I want to say thank you to Michael for his very eye-opening and thought-provoking conversation and presentation on all of his different journeys that you've taken over time. Um, we really do appreciate you being here, so let's give him another round of applause. Thank you to all of you. Oh, we uh, have a little something for you that Rachel's bringing around. It's kind of heavy. Oh. <laughs> but we hope the uh, strings don't break. Thank you very much. So we'll, we'll talk a little appreciation uh, from the county, as we call it here, Harrison County. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming tonight. But I do, before we go, I want to make sure that you're aware that it is homecoming weekend. I see a lot of students in the crowds. We do have, um, I think it's a luau dance tomorrow night, right here. I'm looking to Vanessa for a nod. Luau, right? Here in, in the NPR. We have soccer games this weekend. We have a bonfire. We have fireworks. We have all kinds of fun activities. So don't forget to come out for homecoming. Also, for other, everyone else in the room, too, we have a cultural arts calendar sitting just outside the door. We have comedians. We have a hypnotist. We have other speakers coming in um, this semester. So you don't want to miss out on, on all these fun things. So be sure to grab one of our cultural arts calendars. So thank you all again. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. We really appreciate it.